All right, hey guys, uh, I'm going to give you a quick lecture on Section 4 of the Byzantine Empire and the Crusades. We're going to talk about a guy named uh, Justinian, his civil law code, and some of the stuff that he did, uh, as well as uh, the Crusades. Uh, so the Byzantine Empire created its own unique civilization in the Eastern Mediterranean. As you know, we talked about this uh, the uh, Roman Empire was split up into the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, the Crusades impacted medieval society in both the East and the West. Patriarch is the Eastern Roman Empire's form of the Pope. Uh, we're going to talk about what is a schism is, which means separation, the Crusades, and then, then infidel, which means non-believer. People to identify, uh, Justinian, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, Saladin, Pope Innocent III, and places to locate Constantinople, Syria, Palestine, and the Balkans, which you know because are they are on your map. So in the 5th century, as Germanic tribes moved into the Western Roman Empire, as you already know, the Eastern Roman Empire continued to exist. They didn't get beat up quite as bad as the Western Roman Empire did because they didn't uh, endure the invasions the Western Roman Empire had. Justinian became emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire in 527, and his whole goal was to make the uh, Roman Empire as big as it was uh, back in the day and encompass the entire Mediterranean world, which it had once, uh, you know, conquered. Uh, by 552, he almost had, but only three years after his death, in 565, the Lombards had conquered uh, much of Italy, Italy, reducing its size. And here's a map so you can see... Uh, <clears throat> After Justinian's conquest, he, uh, much of northern Africa, even parts of Spain, Italy, all these territories that had once been the entire Roman Empire um, were reduced, and the Lombards came in and took over Italy again. So, did a pretty good job, but it didn't last long. Justinian's most important contribution was his codification of Roman law in the body of civil law. Uh, lasted for a really long time until 1453. Justinian's conquest left the Eastern Roman Empire in a lot of trouble, though, because Constantinople, for several reasons, Constantinople, uh, it was too hard to protect territory far from Constantinople. The empire was too big. Uh, he spent a bunch of money on some building projects, which we'll talk about in a second, which emptied his treasury. Um, there was a plague that was going through the Eastern Roman Empire, so his population was in great decline as well as renewed threats along its frontiers from the Muslims uh, to the east. So a lot of the same type of things that we saw in the Western Roman Empire are uh, in parity to the Eastern Roman Empire as far as plague, invasions, um, lack of funds, low population, those types of things. The most serious challenge, as I just mentioned, was Islam, which created a new unified Arab force that invaded the Eastern Roman Empire. The empire, uh, that is the East Roman Empire, lost Syria and Palestine after it was defeated at Yarmouk in 636. And in the north, the Bulgars defeated the empire's forces and created a kingdom in the lower Danube Valley. So again, these are the invasions that the Eastern Roman Empire um, succumbed to. So, by the beginning of the 8th century, the much-reduced Eastern Roman Empire consisted only of the Eastern Balkans and Asia Minor. So that's like uh, this territory here and this territory here. So pretty small. There's Constantinople, so pretty much just the areas that it could defend around Constantinople. However, it did last until 1453. Uh, the Byzantine Empire uh, differed from the Western Roman Empire in that it was both Christian and Greek. They kind of dropped the whole Roman thing. Latin wasn't their official language. Greek became the empire's official language. Uh, but they kind of had their own religion in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, also had a bunch of artistic talent, uh, church building, church ceremonies, and church decoration to honor the Christian faith because, as you're going to find out in just a moment, the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire was seen as divine, as appointed by God. Uh, as I just mentioned, the emperor's uh, power was absolute because he was seen as divine. Uh, he exercised political control of the Eastern Orthodox Church because he was appointed the head of the church, called the Patriarch. 
the Byzantines believed that God had commanded their state to preserve the true Christian faith, which is important because they're going to fight a bunch of Muslims here in a minute. Uh, Justinian rebuilt Constantinople in 532. After riots, he destroyed much of the city. It was the largest city in Europe during the Middle Ages, with a huge population. Up to the 12th century, Constantinople was Europe's chief center for trading goods between the West and the East. Lots of stuff, right? You guys have heard this before. The East has silk and spices that, that the, uh, the West wants. Uh, as well as ivory, jewelry from India, wheat and furs from Russia, other stuff from the Balkans. Um, Justinian actually was able to smuggle some silkworms from China uh, and create their own silk, which became the city's most lucrative product. They didn't have to go to China anymore to get it. They could make their own silk, which was kind of a big deal. Uh, Constantinople's appearance in the Middle Ages was mainly due to that big building program that I mentioned, but also drained the treasury. Uh, very Roman-esque, right? Same type of things that we've talked about. Huge palace, hundreds of churches, a giant hippodrome, which is kind of like the Colosseum. It's where they would have gladiator fights and those types of things, chariot races. Um, extensive public works, kind of like, uh, I don't know that they had an aqueduct, uh, but those types of things. Um, underground reservoirs for the city's water supply. Uh, so maybe instead of an aqueduct, they had uh, some sort of aquifer underground. Uh, either way, pretty cool for back then. His greatest building was the Hagia Sophia, or the Church of Holy Wisdom, which was completed in 537. A uh, huge dome, four large piers, which I'll show you a picture of in just a second. Um, really, really big, big deal. The light uh, that uh, that shone into the church symbolized the presence of God in the world. And there is the Hagia Sophia, a pretty impressive building. The Byzantine Empire was troubled by a growing split between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church in the West. Uh, Eastern Church would not accept the Pope as the head of the Christian faith, as well as you can imagine the Western Roman or the Roman Catholic Church would not accept the Patriarch of the Eastern Church as the head of the Christian faith. So in 1054, Pope Leo IX and Patriarch Michael Cerularius excommunicated each other, which means they kicked each other out of the church. They're saying, I am the head of the, the Christian church. You're not the head of the Christian church. You don't have any right to kick me out. I'm kicking you out. Um, it's a big fight. And this created a schism, which means separation between the two branches of Christianity. So now we have two people that are claiming to be the head of the church. Um... Uh, it's just not good for Christianity altogether. And again, a house divided cannot stand, and this is going to create problems because they're going to get invaded by a different religion called the Muslims here in a second. Um, the empire was threatened from abroad, as I just mentioned. The Seljuk Turks, who moved into Asia Minor, were the greatest threat. And in 1071, the Turkish army defeated the Byzantine forces at Manzikert. And this is going to be the premise for the Crusades. Because of that defeat at Manzikert, uh, the emperor of the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, uh, Alexius I, turned to Europe for help. From the 11th to the 13th centuries, European Christians went on a series of military campaigns to regain the Holy Land from the Muslims. Oh, excuse me regarded as infidels or non-believers. And the Holy Land is this area over here. There's Jerusalem, this territory, even today is known as uh, Palestine, and Israel is over here too. Uh, so, these expeditions, these military campaigns, became known as the Crusades, and they started when Pope Urban II agreed to respond to Alexius I's request and among other reasons, the Pope wanted to provide papal leadership for a great cause. So we just talked about the schism, right? This is a way that the Western, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope, could come out and say, hey, uh, you know, maybe I am the true leader because if I send everybody on these crusades and they work, then, um, you know, we'll be defended, everybody won't die, and then everybody might come to uh, my church instead of the Eastern Orthodox Church. So he backs up Alexius I, and... Uh, the Crusades begin. So at the Council of Clermont in 1095, Pope Urban II urged Christians to take up arms in a holy war. Warriors mainly from France joined up. Uh, some joined the, the cause because they believed in Christianity and they thought that it was a good cause. Others just wanted to go on an adventure. Some just liked killing people. 
Uh, some thought they might get territory riches or even maybe some nobility out of it. Uh, the first crusade had an army of several thousand cavalry, 10,000 infantry. Uh, they went down the Palestinian coast. Uh, and reached Jerusalem in 1099, and that map looks like this. So they came down the, I thought I had a better map. Here we go, let's look at this guy right here. So here are the, oh, nope, that's the Third Crusade. Apologize. Maybe this is the best one I've got. So they came down, First Crusade. This blue color right here came down mainly from France, came down to Jerusalem. Boop. Into here, into the Holy Land. Uh, the Crusaders went down to Palestine, as I mentioned, went to Jerusalem in 1099. They took the city and massacred thousands of inhabitants, and nothing spreads the gospel like killing all the people that live in a city. Uh, the victors formed four Latin Crusader states, which were surrounded by Muslim states, which means they didn't last that long. By the 1140s, the Muslims began to start fighting back. Uh, and when one of the Latin states fell, this will be the premise for the Second Crusade. Uh, the monastic leader, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, commissioned King Louis VII of France and Emperor Conrad III of Germany to begin the Second Crusade, and it failed entirely. It didn't work. There's that map. We'll come back to it in a second. In 1187, Jerusalem fell to the Muslims under uh, their leader Saladin, and three Christian rulers began the Third Crusade, Emperor Frederick Barbarossa of Germany, Richard II, or Richard the Lionhearted, which is a sweet name. I think instead of Richie the Great, I should be Richie the Lionhearted, Richard the Lionhearted, Richard the Lionhearted. Uh, it's got a nice ring to it. Uh, of England, and Philip II Augustus of France. The Crusade was not successful, um, meek um, growth out of it. Uh, Frederick drowned in a local river before he even got to the promised land. Uh, Philip decided he was going to pack up and go home, and Richard the Lionhearted negotiated an agreement with Saladin, allowing Christian pilgrims to access Jerusalem. So, not a whole lot came out of it. Whoa! We're not that far yet. There we are, and that's what the uh, Third Crusade looked like, that guy there. About six years after Saladin's death in 1193, Pope Innocent III started the Fourth Crusade. However, it was led by a bunch of Venetian merchants uh, from Italy. Venetian, uh, from it Venetians from Italy, uh, big-time traders. Uh, they used this as an opportunity to, instead of go get the promised land back to actually go sack the city that they were supposed to be helping in Constantinople and saw it as a business venture where they could go take Constantinople and have the greatest trading city in the world. Um, and so instead of actually going to help and fight the Muslims, they attacked other Christians. Byzantine army recaptured the city in 1261, uh, but the empire was never again a great power. And the shrunken empire continued for another 190 years until the Ottoman Turks conquered it in 1453. The final gasp of the Crusades were two children's crusades. In 1212, a German youth named Nicholas of Cologne decided that he was inspired to get a bunch of children together and go uh, fight the Muslims. He went to the Pope and said, hey, Pope, we want to go fight. And the Pope said, uh, go home and do your chores. At about the same time, a group of 20,000 French children sailed for the Holy Land. Two ships uh, that were supposed to be bringing them to the Holy Land to fight uh, drowned. They crashed at sea, and then the other five ships were sold into slavery on the North African coast. They even, even made it. Um, there you go. Uh, historians disagree on the effects of the Crusades. Certainly they benefited some Italian cities economically, but the states probably would have grown economically anyway. Uh, one unhappy effect was that the first widespread European attacks on the Jews began during the Crusades. As they needed to blame somebody, and for some reason when things are going wrong in Europe, they always blame the Jews. Uh, perhaps the greatest impact of the Crusades was political, uh, with the schism, uh, and the eventually helped to break down feudalism which led to strong nation-states, which is going to lead to revolution, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So, 
there are your answers for that. I know all of that was super fast. Send me emails if you have questions. Otherwise, do your that quiz, study for your map quiz, and then um, I'll see you guys tomorrow.